Hello, my name is Ben Busby, and I am the Genomics Outreach Coordinator for NCBI. Welcome to the 2015 NCBI Next Generation Sequencing Online Workshop. Today, I am going to present a set of slides which introduce genomics resources at NCBI. At the end of that presentation, I will be presenting also some community resources for genomics, some thoughts on communicating with bioinformaticians, an overview of the other five to six lectures in this workshop, how to get a hands-on tutorial for RNA-seq mapping, as well as the logistics of this course and where to ask questions. So without further ado, let's begin. What I'm going to talk about today is terminology, NCBI health resources, bioproject, blasting into SRA, what is dbGaP, how to get our reference genomes, as well as how to get large data sets, and where to get more information about NCBI resources. First, I'd like to do a basic overview of next generation sequencing, particularly in the DNA-seq space. So in the DNA-seq space, one would, from a sequencer, obtain FASTQ files. FASTQ files should always be trimmed for quality, and we will go over that in the second lecture of this workshop series. Once these FASTQ files are trimmed for quality, a reference genome sequence should be obtained. I'm going to tell you about that in about 30 minutes. And then these reads should be mapped to a reference genome. That we will go over in lecture four of this workshop. Finally, variants can be called from that mapping. We'll go over that at the end of lecture four of this workshop. A more advanced technique, genome assembly, will not be covered in this workshop. But for completeness, it is outlined in the right column of this diagram. Before we launch in to NCBI resources, I would like to give an overview of terms used in next generation sequencing. For that, I'm going to go to this bit.ly, which you can use as well. When we go to this NCBI genomics glossary, we can see a stylized version of the diagram we saw before. This highlights FASTQ sequence reads, mapping to reference genomes, and then making variant calls and annotating variants. On the other side of things is a simple de novo assembly pipeline, as I mentioned earlier. Perhaps the most important file type in all of next generation sequencing is a BAM file. These are binary files containing reads aligned to a reference genome. It is important to remember that the human readable analog of these files are called SAM files. However, the reason we typically keep these files in binary format is they're about 16% of the size in this format. Coverage refers to how many reads cover the average point in a genome. A typical read coverage for a human genome might be in the range of 4 to 30x. A FASTA file is the most common sequence format used for biological sequences. It can have a variety of file extensions. FASTQ files are the most common unaligned data format for next generation sequencing. The Genome Reference Consortium is a consortium of NCBI, the Sanger Institute, the Genome Institute at Washington University in St. Louis, and EBI. This is a group responsible for the improvement of the human, mouse, and zebrafish reference genome assemblies. 
If you ever wondered what the GRC in GRCH or GRCM means, this is what it is. GFF and GTF files are standard nine column de tab delimited formats for representing annotated features and alignments in genome sequence coordinates and are marked by those file extensions. Indexes are a set of files created when a reference genome is prepared for mapping. And mapping, as we discussed before, aligning short reads to reference genomes. We've discussed reference genomes a few times. SAM files are the human readable analogs of BAM files. In other words, these are FASTQ files mapped to reference genomes and represented in a standard file format, which we will discuss at length later in the course. NCBI databases that provide these data types to users will be covered in detail during this presentation. However, for a quick reference, you can go back to this glossary and look them up. For completeness, we've also included some de novo sequencing terms. However, those terms are beyond the scope of this course, so we will skip them for today. Downstream analysis file formats are also quite important. The most important downstream analysis format, in my opinion, is the VCF. This is a tab delimited file format for communicating variant data and related metadata. Now we will go back to the presentation. Now we're gonna talk about some very popular NCBI resources for obtaining genomic data. Say I was to search tuberculosis in the NCBI home screen or Entree, I would get several million hits across a whole bunch of NCBI databases. I wanna show you a few specific ones and then take a general approach to obtaining genomic data from NCBI. The first database I'd like to show you is ClinVar. ClinVar is a database of sequence variants asserted to be associated with phenotypic variants by particular submitters. As you can see, we have some genetic variants linked to susceptibility to tuberculosis. We can take a look at some of those variants and we can see that they are related to susceptibility. Another thing one can do at the ClinVar website is look at the evidence coming from different submitters. In this particular case, two submitters have claimed that a particular variant is pathogenic and to have claimed it's protective. Now, that could be true given the particular environmental and bacterial context that underlie these cases or lack thereof of tuberculosis. We can also look at genes at the NCBI Variation Viewer. This gives us a view of specific isoforms of genes we may be interested in, ClinVar variants, dbSNP variants, and also structural variants from dbVar. We can search Variation Viewer by location, gene names, or phenotypes, depending on what we're interested in. Many bioinformatics students ask me, is there a one-stop shop for molecular information in bioinformatics? Even before I worked at NCBI, my answer would be NCBI gene. The reason for that is for each of these gen gene entities, there are a wealth of links to other resources, both at NCBI as well as outside of NCBI. One of the most exciting things about the NCBI gene pages is the sequence viewer. By clicking on tracks, one can expand out on the aggregate exon coverage uh, across 24 human tissues to look at different isoforms in different cell types, as well as to upload data from a particular computer or from the internet. 
once again, those functions are accomplished by clicking on the tracks button. Sequences pertaining to particular isoforms can also be downloaded by clicking on the tools menu or by simply right clicking on the isoform of interest. I'd like to show you one more NCBI resource before we jump in to analyzing genomic data. And that NCBI resource is GTR. GTR is the Genetic Testing Registry at NCBI. This is a resource that can be used by clinicians to order genetic tests for their patients. Many of these tests are provided in an easy to access format by commercial testing companies. Now I'd like to show you how to jump in to the petabases of genomic data housed at NCBI. The first tool I like to use for delving into NCBI genomic data is BioProject. BioProject will show a lot of information on a subject such as tuberculosis, but it's also facetable, meaning that one can look at particular data types. For example, I could use these facets to look at RNA-seq data specifically by clicking on transcriptome and SRA. SRA is where our raw sequencing reads from next generation sequencing are kept, and transcriptome implies that this is RNA-based data. If I do that, I would get 34 results. However, it's important to note that this slide was originally made several months ago, and the number of results has grown significantly. At this point, I would challenge you to go to BioProject, search for tuberculosis, filter for RNA-seq, and see how many results you get today. If we dig into a particular BioProject, this particular one for RNA-seq of human melanoma, we can see that we can get a variety of data types, SRA experiments, publications in PubMed, as well as sample information and geo data sets processed by the particular user. If I click on the number of SRA runs on a particular bioproject, this one being clinical isolates of mycobacterium tuberculosis, I get to the SRA database and I can see all of those runs. I can go into individual runs and look at technical metadata related to those runs. I can go further into the browser and look at even more metadata. Some runs in SRA are aligned. If they are aligned, then an alignment tab will appear and I can look at them in the sequence viewer. This is the Homo sapiens APOE gene, and I can clearly see a het in one of the introns. Going back to RNA-seq data in tuberculosis, if I look at RNA-seq data for multifunctional memory T cells, I can go to the SRA page from BioProject, as I showed you before, and I can also click on a particular experiment. This experiment will show me the number of runs, and I can also click on the run selector and get a variety of metadata about the particular experiment. Currently, many studies in the run selector in SRA have quite a bit of metadata. Why would I want to use SRA? Because I can slice a particular region out of the SRA. And as we're going to show you later, we've enabled two popular tools, GATK as well as HiSET, 
to work with DNA-seq data and RNA-seq data in SRA, respectively. However, I would just like to mention, using the SRA toolkit directly, I can slice out a particular aligned region. Why would I want to do this? Because I can slice out a particular region of breast cancer cell lines, look for some particular mutants, and compare that with the thousand genomes, which is exome sequencing of about 2,600 phenotypically normal humans. The SRA toolkit has a lot of options, and those are easy to read in the help documents provided. Also available on our GitHub site, we have a functional read collection API, and from the GitHub site, you can get all kinds of neat examples, like going from SRA data into Spark. Also, the SRA toolkit is available in the toolshed in Galaxy, which we will show you in the next lecture of this workshop. However, what I'd like to show you now is a way for anyone to get into SRA data whether they have prior experience with genomics or not. And that's by using the popular NCBI tool, BLAST. In in-person workshops, when we ask how many people interested in genomics have used BLAST previously, we get a response of 96 or 97% of attendees. So if I search BioProject for something and find, for example, some mice that have been infected with influenza A, I can go to the bio project and once again go to a number of SRA experiments. And by selecting them and clicking on the send to menu, I can send them to BLAST. I then get my normal BLAST page and I can select an accession number or a fast A sequence to blast into those accessions. My first thought when constructing this demo was to blast interferon gamma into these SRA accessions as interferon gamma is commonly upregulated during viral expression. So I can go to the nucleotide database, select mRNA, select a FASTA sequence, and get an mRNA sequence for interferon gamma. I would suggest when blasting into SRA to cut off the poly A tail for reasons that should be somewhat obvious. If they're not obvious, I would highly recommend that you try it both ways. So I can paste my sequence into the normal blast web page and run blast. Unfortunately, in this example, I get not very many significant hits. At first, this was disheartening to me. However, with a quick look at the literature, we can see that influenza A does not stimulate the production of interferon gamma. If we find an mRNA that interferon gamma does stimulate the production of, we can blast it into the same sets and come up with a lot of hits. Additionally, if you wanted to load your own data into SRA for the purpose of being able to blast into it, you could use the LATF loader shown in this GitHub repository. There are a bunch of other cool tools in some other GitHub repositories like the one shown here. Another new blast tool that may be of interest to those interested in genomics is MoleBlast, which will automatically make OTUs from well-conserved sequences in bacteria, fungi, or even viruses. If you're interested for more information, please go to the MoleBlast website and click on the Help tab. Now I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about dbGaP. DBGAP is the NCBI database of genotypes and phenotypes. This is where DBGAP fits in to the NCBI pantheon. 
Currently, dbGaP has over 1.2 million samples from over a million individuals. Investigators can get to dbGaP data through authorized access, as it is protected by U.S. law. dbGaP also has a number of analysis sets, such as these p-values from a GWAS study. There is a lot of different data in dbGaP, and this diagram shows different types of data and the relative amounts we have. Lately, there has definitely been a growth in the whole genome portion for genomics sequence data. If one has access to dbGaP, one will soon be able to search by minimum read coverage and by minimum allele percentage across dbGaP studies, as shown here. If one has approved access to particular studies, one should be able to go in and look at data for particular individuals. We are also putting aggregate data, aggregate dbGaP data, in ClinVar. In a ClinVar page, much like the one I showed you earlier, we can now see variants in dbGaP, those called by dbGaP submitters, as well as the ones we see in aligned sequence data. There are also background sets for short nucleotide variation derived from the 1,000 genomes in GoESP. We are working to expand those background sets into larger areas of dbGaP, as you saw with the recent ClinVar example. I'd like to talk a little bit now about how to get reference genomes from NCBI. First, I'd like to introduce the new Human Genome Assembly, the GRCH38. GRCH38 is made by the Genome Reference Consortium that I mentioned before. Also, one can get reference genomes for many bacterial species, at this point about 37,000 of them. One can look at the genome website for relationships between these species, and if one wants to get sequence for these particular genomes, one can go to the NCBI assembly website. By going to the assembly website and clicking on a particular strain, one can see all the examples of those strains that we have and go to particular examples and to their corresponding FTP sites to get the FASTA files, annotation files, and also protein FASTA files. As of July 13, 2015, we had 38,000, over 38,000, RefSeq assemblies. 4,200 of these, roughly, were complete genomes, with the rest being scaffolds or contigs. Some changes we've made lately are that for proteins with identical sequence, we have combined their accessions into what we now know as WPs. However, there are still individual annotations on reference genomes. What are reference genomes? Reference genomes are genomes of high quality sequence and annotation that we have identified um, and annotated by the NCBI PGAP pipeline. We also have representative genomes in taxa uh, without reference genomes, as well as variant genomes that are typically represented on the scaffold or contig assembly level and do not link to NCBI gene. The NCBI prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline is diagrammed here. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about access to large data sets, and I'll be talking specifically about how to access genomic variants as well as use the eUtils facilities to cross between NCBI databases. One example of a large data set I use frequently is the aggregated data from the ClinVar resource 
in VCF format. This can be easily localized on either the GRCH37 or the GRCH38 reference at the ClinVar FTP site. Another very useful VCF or XML that can be accessed by FTP is that of dbSNP. Feegenie provides a phenotype genotype integrator where one can search by phenotype, location, gene, or SNP for significant relationships between phenotype and genotype. The last NCBI topic I'll address today is eUtils. eUtils are a way to cross between NCBI databases, and a specific video is available at the NCBI webinars page, which is easily accessible by Googling NCBI webinars. NCBI eUtils allow you to cross between many NCBI databases. Here is a cloud of the NCBI eUtilities, and these are some examples of some of the things that these allow you to do. We've also introduced eDirect, which are eUtilities on the Linux command line. We also have a dbGaP data browser that will be out soon for those interested in visual access to dbGaP data. More detailed information about NCBI resources can be found at our webinars page. Here I have provided a link to some other community resources for genomics that are not available at NCBI. This is a very large list, but you or your colleagues may know of other tools that are not present. This is provided on GitHub as a place where people are able to add tools by simply doing pull requests. A couple of quick pieces of advice about communicating with bioinformaticians. Please come up with specific questions and workflows. Do have a specific question. Don't ask someone to find something cool in the data. I want to give a quick overview of each lecture in this workshop. This lecture will be followed by a lecture about the FASTQ file format and some quality checks that can be done with the Galaxy program. It'll also provide a brief overview of what the Galaxy framework for genomics is. That will be followed by a brief overview of Linux command line basics. Almost every community program for genomics is written in the Linux framework. If you understand the basics of the Linux command line, then you should be able to use some of these tools. Also, there will be portions of the rest of the course which are taught in the Linux command line. For example, the following two lectures on DNA-seq and variant calling, as well as RNA-seq mapping and read counts, which will be presented by Jonathan Pebsner. Finally, Tom Medden, the head of the NCBI BLAST group, will present a lecture about how to leverage new BLAST capabilities for genomics research. At the end of the lectures, you will be able to use a hands-on RNA-seq mapping tutorial. I'd like to thank the following people for putting together this short workshop of lectures. And finally, the advantage of taking the workshop between October 13th and October 23rd is that you can ask questions and we will respond to them live. What you will do to ask questions is to go to Biostars, found at biostars.org, and tag your questions with the NCBI Now tag. Thank you very much, and have a great day.